All right, so th this, we're starting off here, trying to just sort of get a baseline of, um, now that we've sort of reached uh, chapter you know, eight and chapter nine of the text, we're reaching the end. We're starting to see, I think that a lot of concepts return. And we're also starting to see, especially in chapter nine, uh, a bit of a conversation with the contemporary, right? So you see this, for example, in an, in an incredibly interesting point that he makes, um, just, just a little aside, and then I'll get back to what we're trying to do here. He says, you know, Freud gave us the first modern myth of incest in Totem and Taboo, and in some sense in Oedipus as well. But largely Freud's myth has to do with resolving for Western European subjects, um, the fundamental taboo of incest. Uh, however, uh, what we need also is to create a myth of cannibalism. And this is where uh, our friend Gabriel Tupanamba, who incidentally shares the same homophony of the Tupanamba tribe from South America, who participated in cannibalism and who Gerard actually speaks of a lot in chapter nine. Um, he it kind of reminds me of the um, uh, Vivieros de Castro work in some sense, although he's not necessarily creating a, a myth. Um, but anyways, that's a little aside. So we'll get into some of those things, but I wanted to start from a more general sense. And this is excerpts from uh, Gerard's uh, critical review of, of Anti-Oedipus. And some of these are very interesting because he's trying to speak to an audience uh, uh, who may not know what mimetic desire is. So he's sort of repeating it over and over and over in ways that I find very useful. So one of them that I've highlighted here, he says, first of all, it's necessary to set forth the principle of mimetic desire of a desire in mimesis prior to all representation and all selection of an object. And then he continues, what desire imitates, what it borrows from a model is desire itself prior to gestures, attitudes, manners, and everything to which mimesis is usually reduced when it is understood only as representation. This mode of imitation operates uh, with a quasi uh, somotic immediacy necessarily betrayed and lost in all the dualities of the modern problematics of desire, including the conscious and the unconscious. Okay, remember just a minute ago before we recorded this, I was giving a bit of a background on what Batson gives us and which Deleuze and Guattari will really roll with is a different theory of dualism than what Freud I think was dealing with in his notion of dualism, um, mainly here dualism of the drives. For Batson, modern Western life is structured around a fundamental double bind. And so the whole idea of calling psychosis a type of general condition, not just an extreme condition, but a general condition of extremities that are imposed on man in a dualist structure, right? And that's based on the notion that society's injunction is fundamentally contradictory because it up the law uh, mm -hmm. operates with a both and, right? Um, you could you could link this in an interesting way to the ambivalence of the father, right? Um, uh, so uh, you know the, the the idea of of this uh, uh, is very significant because it, it creates conditions of generative social violence. So uh, Gerard is big on generative, trying to give an account of what, what is generative. And I think one answer that Batson gives us is that the double bind produces generative violence through what he calls schismogenesis. Schismogenesis, right? Which is the effect of this dual psychotic injunction that we live with, right? Um, so that's an important background because why do I say that? Look at this quote here on, on his theory of mimetic desire. 
he's saying that it's prior to that in some sense. You see, you see what I'm saying? So that's also why he's a bit frustrating for psychoanalysis, which if psychoanalysis is a mythical uh, apparatus being uh, placed onto a condition of a double bind, a general double bind, uh, you can now see that if mimetic desire is more primary than that, it doesn't um, have its impetus from this problematic. It has its impetus in something more primary, which is what uh, is produced in the emergence of desire as such. Hmm. So I think that's important for us to understand why Girard is often very dismissive mm -hmm. because he feels that he's discovered something that's prior to the double bind. Okay, very fine. We can locate historically the emergence of the double bind. It's like, you know, did the Greeks have it? No, not exactly, right? They had a completely different composition of their law, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, point number three here, mimetic desire is at times so inextricably mixed with other things that probably no kind of analysis can isolate it. Then he says, it is nonetheless necessary to pose the other extreme of need and appetites, a pole of desire itself, which while both evident and mysterious is not libido, but mimesis. So uh, again, uh, he's in a conversation here with Dulos and Guattari, but he's really in a conversation with the wider psychoanalytic theory of desire, which is what they're reinventing, right? Um, so for them, as you probably know, desire is uh, socialized, it's not idealized, which is a movement that Girard likes. What does that mean? Remember when Girard said Freud is wrong in Totem and Taboo and um, his theory of the Oedipus complex because he uh, is reliant on a form of consciousness that the child would have of sexual uh, repression or of, of, of the sexual pleasure of the parents as well, which is something he also talks about, right? So it would be in that sense that the Freudian model is, is idealist, mm -hmm. as the Marxists would accuse it of, and which is exactly what Deleuze and Guattari will accuse psychoanalysis of, and which is why they'll side with Wilhelm Reich against Freud and make the claim that repression is socially bound up, bound up within the social. And in fact, Gerard has something very interesting to say about repression being bound up in the social, by the way, in this review. I, I can't recommend you read this review enough. I really think it's good. I had one, one quick thing that's been bothering me about that Gerard's comments about like the consciousness of the Oedipal dynamic is because I think it follows shortly after where he seems to have no qualms with the notion of infantile sexuality, but then for there to be like a conscious, even like instantaneous moment of, of like Oedipal sexual awareness seems barred for Gerard. And I can't work those two things together. I don't really know where he's coming from with that. Um, you'd have to show me the passage. I mean, I think the issue here um, is that uh, uh, there is a necessary operation um, because desire is fundamentally bound up with pleasure, sexual pleasure as well, right? But not only sexual pleasure, because there's also forms of, like Lacan would say, phallic jouissance, which are actually not tied into sexual pleasure exactly, right? So, uh, but still, it's a different, it's pleasure, but it's not exactly the same kind of sexual pleasure, right? So uh, it's uh, in that way that, I think you have a complexity because the mimetic structure can still, still still superimpose itself onto that, but not necessarily so. That's a classic Girardian um, kerfuffle that we often find, right? Which is, oh, you know, so and so thinker has brought in this apparatus to theorize mimetic desire, but they miss it. They're they're not fully uh, grasping its logic. They're because they're reliant on this other operation and in the case here hmm. it's, it's the it's the consciousness of the child's relationship to sexual pleasure i believe but also he even goes further and suggests that freud will make the claim that um 
uh, you know, the, the status of the father is also uh, theorized in a way which is um, ultimately a reflection of, this is a very you know, classic liberal conservative reading of Freud, which we've seen many times, which is uh, to say this is sort of a reflection of his own self-analysis of his own father issues or something like that, right? So I don't know, Cade, maybe you, while we're reviewing these, you could go back in the text and find that passage. And, and Yeah, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do that and send it okay. to the group. Okay, so uh, I hope this is helpful for us to understand my medic desire here so we can continue on. He says, desiring mimesis precedes the appearance of, his, of its object and survives the disappearance of every object. It's mm -hmm. very interesting. In the end, this desire in mimesis engenders its objects, but nevertheless, it always appears to the outside observer as a triangular configuration, the angles of which are occupied. So, you know, I was reading this and I didn't quite have the time to graph it, to diagram it, but I am gonna diagram for our next meeting um, because I think that, uh, if you do like a Google search of images of Girard, you don't see many diagrams. Like Girardians are not big on diagrams, but maybe we should. I think it would be nice, you know, when we apply for our um, uh, $200,000 grant proposal to the Peter Thiel Foundation for the study of mimetic desire, we can fill our proposal with diagrams and math themes <laughs> and they will be very impressed and give <laughs> us the money. Um, um, I'm, I'm not kidding, actually. This is serious. Okay. I believe we'll, you. We'll invite uh, Gabriel Tupanamba to come in and, and perform his magic uh, with diagrams as well. Okay. So let's try to follow this. The object always comes to the foreground and mimesis is hidden behind it. Even in the eyes of, and I want to read this and then I want to hear what you all think because this is very useful. The object always comes to the foreground of mimesis is hidden behind it, even in the eyes of desiring subjects. So the convergence of desire therefore defines the object. It is truly impossible to fix the origin of and responsibility for the rivalry whose inexhaustible source is mimesis. Mimesis cannot spread without becoming reciprocal, extremely important. At every instant, the rivals assume the roles of model and disciple. Mimetic desire always plays off a desire that is already mimetic. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you, you, you're almost thinking of a kind of object of a kind of force field around it in, in this way combined with another subject position, which also has a kind of mimesis encroachment or encirclement around it. And the obvious question is on, on what basis does mimesis precede the appearance of its object and the disappearance of it? So I wonder if there might be an analogous aspect here of what Nietzsche, Nietzsche talks about as sort of the world is sort of consistently becoming. So it's sort of always in flux is the way that I read that. And if mimetic desire sort of matches up with this flux in the way that we sort of characterize objects and language and violence, and it sort of is there before we might try to capture it and it's there after we might try to explain it. Um, I wonder if that might be an analogous um, reading. Yes. Um, that's, that's a good point. And uh, what Gerard will say about Nietzsche is that uh, Nietzsche discovered that um, uh, through his two concepts, one resentment and one will to power. He discovered that there is a, um, uh, a kind of uh, uh, 
naturalization of desire, which uh, almost performs, if you like, as Gerard reads it, a type of dialectic between resentment and the will to power. And he even goes so far as to suggest that uh, for Deleuze, um, I don't know if I didn't put the quote in here, but he says something very interesting, which is one of the problems of anti-Oedipus is that Deleuze relies on a theory of resentment, which is castration. Mm. So it's a very fascinating point, which is that um, when Deleuze performs a kind of Nietzschean slash Marxian um, reappraisal of the sensuous object of desire as socially constituted in the very beginning of Anti-Oedipus, right? Um, you, you, get, you get a hint of a footnote from the early Marx in the thesis on Feuerbach and this notion of the sensual uh, material object as the, the fundamental real of consciousness. You get that hint. Then you also get all of this Wilhelm Reich business, which I mentioned a moment ago. But what Gerard points, points out is that, um, let me actually just do something and, and uh, be even better and share exactly what he says with you because it's worth it. Um, Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think I've highlighted this here. Yeah. So here, here's where it is right here. You see where he says the omnipotence the omnipotence of desire and production is absolutely indistinguishable in practice from a radical castration. So let's read a little bit before that so we're a little bit clear. In anti oedipe or anti-Oedipus, the will to power becomes unconscious desire, desire and production. All real desire, all activity of a relational and social character, including, I presume, the writing of anti-Oedipus itself, arises from resentment. And resentment is the theory that consciousness cannot corral um, something within the human that is more primary, which is a reservoir of uh, instinctual and what psychoanalysis will call libidinal urges, right? And these are um, kind of in a conflict with the subject of consciousness, right? And this is why Socrates is such a imposter for Nietzsche, because Socrates will reject the supremacy of resentment. You see, he will reject the supremacy of the definition of the human being as a resentment subject. So uh, then he continues, Deleuze's enterprise can be defined as a new effort to differentiate the will to power from resentment in order to quarantine the active forces from contamination by the reactive forces. It's interesting we're thinking quarantine here because of um, all of the business of sacred. So this is a sort of way to read the sacred in Deleuze, by the way. Um, while burying the former deeply beneath the latter, abandoning to resentment all activities that Nietzsche was still too concrete, not modern enough to cast away. The procedure is very efficient, but it is the efficiency of a miser who buries his treasure so well that he cannot find it again. The omnipotence of desiring production is absolutely indistinguishable in practice from a radical castration. We are told that desire is prodigiously revolutionary, but we search in vain for examples of the will to power in this book. I only see the small child playing all alone with his toys. <laughs> um, so uh, have I convinced you to read this article yet? It's pretty good, huh? Yeah. Um, 
so uh, the distinction of desiring is productive or um, productive desire is also a way for Deleuze and Guattari to pull off the accelerationist procedure or experiment, which is to um, ride certain antinomies of capitalism at the mode of production as well um, to the end, as it were. And um, uh, later on in this article, by the way, uh, Gerard will make the claim that um, in fact, what they end up doing is not adequately uh, exiting the very double bind through the theory of plateaus and so on that they claim to be positing uh, because of the way in which they actually create schizoanalysis and schizoanalysis, long story short, Gerard is not convinced of its efficacy. Uh, but I, I haven't actually fully finished the article yet because um, uh, I'm, I'm taking it sort of really slow because it's that good. Um, so let me uh, stop sharing this unless there's any comments on this right now. Um, one quick thing would relate back to my question before is because even in, in that ninth chapter again too, Gerard seems to have something of a like an allergy to castration as a concept because um, in that one myth that he recapitulates about the the cross cousins who end up both being disfigured, um, like he says how like oh the psychoanalyst would view this in castration, but the loss of difference makes more sense. It seems like there's something of a general version. I think that's. I was trying to get at with like the capitalist discourse. I feel like the economy that's produced with um, like the sacrificial economy runs along similar lines with like, doesn't the capitalist discourse kind of like foreclose castration as well in a certain way? Right, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And then I did find that quote, I can put it in the chat right now. It's, it's on 176 in my book, but he's, this is right before he states out his objection to the consciousness of the edible complex. One second. So yeah, cool. So he says, let me make myself clear. I'm not objecting to certain basic Freudian assumptions, such as the attribution to the child of libidinal desires similar to adults, but rather to the bold and surely untenable assertion, which stands at the very center of his system, that the child is fully aware of the existing rivalry of the hostile coloring. And so what I'm getting from is if there are these libidinal desires, but there's no sense of awareness with it, sorry one second, that it creates again, this is a similar sort of economy that doesn't take into account like subjective formation at all. It's just like an economy of desire as like almost like a natural object in a certain way. Interesting. Yes, I think that's true. Again, desire is, I think, um, to be relegated uh, through uh, technologies such as religion to its proper place. It must be contained. And uh, unless society learns how to properly contain desire, it's in for a whirlwind of trouble, according to Gerard. And uh, Kayim, the answer is uh, delirium as system is the name of the article that Gerard, I put it in the Slack. And one thing I didn't mention is that, as you know, in Antioedipus, the psychotic or the delirious subject is, uh, seen as a, a more privileged subject than the neurotic. You know, they'll famously make the claim that uh, it's more uh, significant for revolutionary thought to think about a psychotic out on a walk than a neurotic on the couch. And mm -hmm. so they, they want to flip and invert, which is why they will invert most of the Freudian categories, right? Which is also why um, what Gerard thinks that they're doing is basically giving a counter myth that's still too tied to psychoanalysis actually for him, for him, he's actually thinking they don't go far enough and that their uh, advocacy for the delirious subject, why is that interesting? Because they think that the delirious subject is refusing the double bind in a certain way and that they can enter into a different mode of intense life and life expression that's non-repressive. Right. If if so, that's the sort of wager or the sort of proposal of anti-Oedipus. Right. Um, 
I think it's a tragedy that Gerard's critique here is not more well read by Deleuze and Guattari scholars. I think it's an interesting critique at the minimum because um, he really breaks it down. You know, he goes into all of their questions on the double and the shortcomings with the double. He goes into uh, all of their readings on Proust um, and, 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 uh, and so much. So, uh, but I know that we're here to talk about violence in the sacred, so. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. And I wanted to kind of follow up on what you're saying there about the psychotic, because one of the um, things that sticks out to me of, the, <clears throat> of an explanation of the, the psychotic is someone who's sort of able to um, navigate in a pre-symbolic sense. So in other words, somebody who's sort of okay with ambiguity to the nth degree. And it's it sort of, um, I, think, I think that can also sort of paint here a little bit of what, what we're talking about, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the question is, for Gerard, it seems like he's taking an interpretation of sort of moral uh, religion as sort of this historical given. Whereas if you look at Nietzsche, I think he has a different opinion of it, that it is resentment that creates then this alternative uh, method. Um, and I wonder if uh, Gerard talks about that or does he sort of take a different view then to say, no, no, that's Nietzsche's wrong. I, I'm not sure I follow all that. Um, oh, sure. Um, well, uh, I think that uh, Gerard does have an interesting essay on Nietzsche, which I've looked at. And uh, uh, in general, uh, he credits Nietzsche as an incredibly significant philosopher for a number of reasons. I think that um, he, he is uh, highly sympathetic in some ways to the Nietzschean proposal of the of the will to power. I mean, look at this uh, quote that I've, I've put here. It kind of, I think, lays it out pretty well. A notion such as the will to power can only surface at that moment when desire, no longer able to hide its mimetic nature, openly claims it in order to perpetuate its illusion of mastery. In the end, desire rushes headlong into the disasters awaiting it. So you don't have will to power until you have a subject of resentment subject of resentment sort of um, disturbs uh, 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 the social order, producing a, a, a crisis of nihilism, right? And it's in this opening or chasm of the crisis of values and nihilism that you have a contestation of a new form of master slave. So the, the, uh, the erosion of the social order through resentment is resolved through will to power. Now, in a Girardian lens, the will to power is what uh, might we call a right, or not a right exactly, but what we would call it. It's, it's like a, um, um, a conquering of mimetic desire, I, I suppose, or it's, it's a treatment of it, right? And um, uh, so yeah, I, I, but, so but it I, sounds like um, yeah. what what Gerard is saying is that resentment is already made up, is already part of the structure that we're trying to sort of um, master. Is that well? Right? No, I think yes. I mean, yes. Yeah. That's that, that. In general, in general, absolutely. I think yeah. that that's absolutely correct. Which is yeah. resentment. We know from chapter two, or we can point to chapter two as the. Uh, issue of the crisis of distinction, which is the kind of precondition of the tragic cosmos. Okay, for, okay. Right? So now I've got, now I'm getting it. Would be um, that which unfurls in a uh, social order of stasis or that is suffering from a um, okay. collapse of legitimacy or of disenchantment. Okay. A number of motifs in which you could kind of pull from, right? Okay, I gotcha. Uh, yeah, so. I don't think that Gerard has a strong uh, uh, critique of Nietzsche other than to credit him with realizing a number of important things about the nature of desire and other things. So anyways. Um, Can you, uh, I wanted to 
if it's all right, I, I wanted to kind of go back to your question about how desire is prior and what that means prior to the object. Yes. Because my understanding is that because Gerard sets up this triangle, which is the model, the rival and the object, um, the desire must be prior in the sense to the object that it must go through the model before it reaches the object. Um, right, so the object is never, it's like you're born desiring, but you don't know what to desire or understand and so you have the model shows or redirects the desire to the object and the object is arbitrary is my understanding yes. so that's why yes. i think it's always prior yes and but this is why it like it um i've still been confused by what desire is for gerard because again i mean i think like generally in kind of the psychoanalytic understanding of the subject other we have this kind of explanation for desire in that desire is always desire of the other in that um you know i must i sense that the other holds kind of the kernel of my identity the 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 other has my lack right yeah um and so then you can kind of understand how desire is formed and how it works but for gerard it's just like we're born or whatever desiring there's no idea like how this, what, where this desire comes from, where, like, what is the energy for it or, or impetus or anything. Yes. Um, and then it's just redirected through the model. Yes. So, and, and when that happens, like, I think this goes to Kate's question as well, which is that there is no real relationality there in that. And I think that's intentional. I think Gerard, you know, he, he, he takes the subject other, and then he kind of splits the other into the object and the model. And yeah. then the, he transforms the subject into the rival. Um, and therefore, like, there isn't a relationality in the same way. There, and, there isn't, and therefore, there isn't subjectivity in the same way. That's not nearly as important, I think, for Girard. Uh, mm -hmm. At least that's, I don't know, this is my interpretation going uh, forward uh, right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that you're right. And I think that um, the, the, the way to read this, uh, elusive, almost paradoxical simplicity is to refer to Gerard as a modern Gnostic for whom a certain theory of the object or what we might call in philosophy phenomenology um, is at play, right? And um, that is itself in this case, an extraordinarily, um, kind of non-object oriented ontology in, in, in some way. Like in other words, um, uh, for Gerard, I feel like his Gnosticism may be the secret to all of these questions of, of like, okay, what is actually primary? All right, what is the actual function, right? Okay, well, like, um, uh, well, we know that desire is caught up within this triangle and we, we see its relationship to model and so on, but well, fine, but answer, answer why it is that the mimesis is so ever present. Is the mimesis so ever present always or only under conditions of a collapse, introduction of nihilism, et cetera, et cetera. That is actually unclear to me as well. In other words, in Girard, it's often the case that um, you, you have a kind of careful contextualization of uh, the, the, the outbreak of desire. I don't even have to say mimetic desire because desire is also always mimetic in some way, right? So you have the outbreak of desire, but then what if you don't? I'm just, you see my point, I'm kind of, um, curious about the causality of the Girardian thing as well. So I feel like um, some of these questions, by the way, which we're asking here are very philosophical. And I think that many of them are actually answered in um, this book over here. The uh, Things Hidden book. Uh, 
I think I posted it in the Slack on PDF if anybody would like to look at it because in there, uh, chapter uh, book three gets at much of this in chapter book three, chapter two called desire without object. I would recommend that we look at this uh, maybe even for next time. Okay. Because this will get into these sorts of um, phenomenological and kind of, you know, um, original philosophical questions. So, because I don't really think violence in the sacred is answering these. So we should not be so hard on ourselves to say, oh, well, you know, what are we missing? It's not, we're not missing much, actually. I think the book isn't really about these questions. I think that his theory of desire invites these questions, though. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, very much so. Yeah, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but it is highly elusive. Oh, and the other thing we need to look at is this whole business of, of uh, Gerard's Gnosticism is, is actually um, articulated um, by Gillian Rose in her book called The Broken Middle, which has a chapter on Gerard and Gnosticism. Okay. Um, and I put that in the Slack as well. I think that would be very useful for us to look at because it is talking about placing Gerard as a, in a philosophical kind of context, right? So, uh, all right. Um, let's move back to the text. Um, I, I, I only read, but I didn't take notes on chapter eight on the, the Levi Strauss chapter. Um, I'm sorry, chapter nine on uh, Levi Strauss structuralism and marriage laws. Although it's a very interesting chapter, I highly recommend it. Um, I know Levi, you've done uh, a fair amount of work on Levi Strauss. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that chapter you wanted to jump in on. I could say a few things. Um, Sorry, I think my internet's cutting out here. I, I, oh, I think I'm back maybe. But Can we hear I, you? I heard you. Okay, I heard you mention Levi Strauss. But yeah, I, I think I can, I hope I can maybe make a couple comments on that as well. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, you know, in general, uh, he was, he's moving to a theory of kinship and of the family which Levi Strauss organizes uh, his theory on sort of three different fundamental forms of relation within kinship networks and um, basically discusses, I think some interesting points apropos um, the fundamental foundation of kinship networks being based on the prohibition of incest. So that is, in his studies, paramount. Um, the other one is that he's get gaining here from Levi Strauss, and I think this is a critique of psychoanalysis, is that uh, family, the family form and so on, is uh, not necessarily structured around the repressive uh, status of the mother-father sexual relation as psychoanalysis presumes. I mean, I'll never forget, um, like Lacan in some seminar said, need I remind you that during the time of St. Augustine, sexual, the sexual act, you know, having sex, uh, had zero uh, pleasure associated with it, right? So the, the, the kind of highly recent um, sexualization of the family uh, and Michel Foucault also talks about this in the history of sexuality and the notion that why he's able to say psychoanalysis died with the Victorian epoch, right? Um, because it was relying on the same notion of repression and so on. So Levi Strauss is invoked in part as an assault on Freud because he shows that the family structure is not reliant on a kind of mob, a, a kind of 
conscious, and again, the issue of consciousness comes in of the child's conscious awareness of the uh, repressive zone of sexual pleasure. In other words, uh, Gerard's saying that, but he's also saying something else, which is um, we still must have a proper quarantining or uh, one big theme, by the way, here is spatiality and proximity. That's a huge theme in these last chapters. Um, the idea of proximity of interior, exterior, of inside, outside community, and of uh, quarantine of the sacred within is of extreme importance, right? And the, um, the way that we see this play out is actually in the way in which the Tupanamba tribe uh, will generate a very interesting um, uh, uh, logic of surrogate victim from the prisoners that they take in their uh, cannibalistic uh, ventures. So uh, anyways, that's a very significant thing. But So what Gerard is basically saying there is that uh, the family is not to be understood as a fundamental vessel of a kind of sexual repressive nature. Um, I don't know, Leva, if you want to add anything more to that. I think it, 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 it just in general is interesting because to be honest, Gerard becomes a kind of interlocutor to uh, perhaps a very emancipatory critique of the family is what I, my indication is, to be generous to his approach here. Um, I don't know if anyone else gets that impression. Yeah, I think, I think that the, it's no accident that Gerard is going to Levi Strauss at this moment, because as you said, Daniel, Levi Strauss is in some sense trying to think through the Freudian myth. He's trying to think through the no of the father um, and how it structures uh, what he initially calls culture in uh, the elementary uh, structures of kinship. Um, and he basically, yes, he, he lands on what he calls the incest taboo, right? Uh, which is kind of his reformulation, I think, of this, this Freudian primordial father and the know of the father, um, to say that actually incest is the thing that then spurs culture forward. Because if you can't sleep with your mother, if you can't sleep with your sister or your daughter, then that, all, that no also turns the family outward so that there's an exchange of women, right? As Gerard says. But so Gerard, I think he turns to Levi Strauss and kind of very viciously tries to critique him or go beyond him or whatever, specifically because otherwise I think at this exact point, people would say, well, what are you doing that's different than Levi Strauss? And I think that that's a, an important thing to, to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's helpful. I mean, um, um... It, it is uh, uh, the case that Gerard is interested in the same general problem that psychoanalysis is interested in, apropos of the family, which is, um, but from a different angle, because he's still thinking about this. And part of this is a, is a limitation of the language issue, because he's so tied into the notion of myth and rights and religion that, he, you know, if Gerard was a kind of family counselor, you know, he would be referring to mother, father, uh, 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 the necessity of them to create uh, certain rights uh, uh, so that they are capable of um, uh, cordoning off uh, uh, places for which uh, prohibition is enacted. Because um, uh, if you don't have a uh, space in a family unit where um, that, is, that is prohibited to go or prohibited to enter into. Um, uh, and, and here, think, think distinction, okay? Think distinction, because if you don't have that, um, you have, you have a, a, a mimetic desire break out, right? Which, in some sense makes makes a lot of sense. I mean, why is it that Lacan will reverse 
the father's no to the father's yes. That is a fact of the humiliation of the father. If you ever want to understand the Lacanian theory of the father, you need to go read a play by a French playwright named Paul Claudel. And he wrote a trilogy of books um, on the idea of the humiliated father, right? And he had the idea, he was a Catholic playwright, brilliant playwright. He had the idea that modern, the modern family, um, and Lacan tried to periodize this in one of the first real texts that he ever published on the family complexes. Um, but he had the idea that there is a certain uh, post Protestant structure of the family uh, that affected the father's authority, right? And so that the, uh, uh, the way in which family conflicts and uh, the, the, the structure of repression within a family is actually needs to be very much rethought from the Freudian structure. I don't know if you're all aware of this. Like the, the Lacanian father is completely different than the Freudian father, right? Um, and there's a, um, uh, uh, the, other, the other play by Claudel is called The Hostage. Um, an incredible, incredible play about um, somebody who takes the Pope as hostage, as a kind of crisis of the father figure. So, um, but you know, it reminds me that, you know, maybe one way to think about Gerard here is that uh, in the master's discourse, you don't have mimetic desire. You don't really have, you don't have it break out because you have a certain um, efficacy of the law. But when you have a breakdown and you no longer allow for the sacred to permeate the social space, right? And I think he's very much thinking topographically here in these last two, three chapters. Then you have mimesis. So therefore I'm tempted to suggest that like that is, that is true. That like, in other words, it's not that you always have desire. It's like, it's like uh, the environment must experience a decay and then you have desire. I'm even, even thinking of the um, Tree of Life film by Terrence Malick with, you know, this weird uh, reversion back to the dinosaurs, having this like primordial master slave conflict you remember that in that mystical part of the movie? It makes me wonder, it's like a very Girardian uh, movie. If you rewatch it, you know, the one with Brad Pitt. Uh, I'm just, just thinking about this is also reading this incredible uh, essay on the concept of decadence in Hegel, where it makes a kind of similar argument um, that like, it's actually the uh, social order that undergoes decadence, which is a kind of um, entropic struggle around this kind of Spinozist uh, commitment to self-striving that produces the condition of the master-slave dialectic, right? So it's almost like we think of master-slave or mimetic desire as kind of like the throne condition of man. And I don't think that that's necessarily true. I think it's actually the effect of a certain uh, distorted environment. Anyways, okay. Um, so let's go through this because I think in chapter 10, we get a, a, a lot of really good clarification on a lot of things. Number one is that um, the function of surrogate victim um, is, is that the surrogate victim allows for the regeneration or the renewal of a cultural order. So I'm thinking here of, um, I'm thinking here of Trump, right? Like I couldn't help but think of that article on Gerard and the new inquiry. You know, that, that uh, avant-garde magazine that we, are you guys familiar with the new inquiry? Yeah, I read that article. It was it was um, it was interesting. Yeah, I, I felt like it was actually really dated because right now Trump is like the tables have turned in the classic sense. 
and I think that um, uh, it's sort of from a, from a from a kind of certain uh, logical point of view. I don't know if we can call Trump a surrogate victim, but I think that Trumpism is absolutely um, emerging as a new form of scapegoat. Anyways. Um, and then he says something really beautiful. I love this Heraclitus uh, point about Dionysius. He says, Dionysius and Hades are the same. Uh, so you see the point there, which is if the Dionysian right is a right of renewal from an elementary baseline level, uh, death is the renewer, right? Um, anyways, so figure of death and the figure of uh, extreme uh, celebration and so on. It's an interesting kind of homology. Okay. Um, and then this is one thing we should just note for our, our uh, retention that um, Surrogate victims uh, must be arbitrary, right? So that's important. And um, uh, what else does he say? He says, the fact that the soccer, and here we're, we're thinking of Giorgio Agamben's notion of homo soccer, same thing. The, the soccer is a, a figure who, uh, you guys know the figure of the soccer in uh, Roman, era. He was the one who is eligible for elimination, but um, who is kind of placed within the society was indifferent, let's say. Um, uh, but Gerard offers a different reading. He says, the fact that the soccer can be understood in terms that require no anthropomorphic presence demonstrates that religion should not be defined as animism or anthropomorphism if religion consisted of humanizing the non-human or bestowing souls wherever they were left to be lacking. An impersonal apprehension of the sacred would not be possible. So again, uh, what he's getting at here is that, uh, and this is actually one of the beauties of the last few chapters is that he's, he's, he's narrowing in on his theory of religion as well. So he's, he's, he's clarifying the relationship between the sacred and the violence He's clarifying his theory of religion and he's re-articulating um, all of the core uh, concepts. Okay. Um, the sacred involves order as well as disorder, peace as well as war, creation as well as destruction. In fact, the sacred seems to be heterogeneous, to be so heterogeneous that the specialists have despaired of ever sorting it out. Yet the theory of generative violence permits us to define the sacred in simple concrete terms that emphasize its underlying unity without overlooking its complexity. It enables us to bring together all the disparate elements of the sacred into an intelligible whole. Um, the best men can hope for in their quest for nonviolence is the unanimity minus one of the surrogate victim. So, uh, and then he has this whole critique of social contract theory, which if you go to page 273, he outlines it. I was a little bit um, confused of this. Uh, oh, by the way, do, do you remember this whole business on um, uh, the, the status of the metal worker within the African sacred king uh, social order, super, super. I can retell it if anyone is not uh, familiar with it. Yes, please. Okay, so the basic idea here is very beautiful, which is part of the reason. Remember when I was saying at the beginning that you have um, uh, in the Balinese social context or in other uh, examples, of social orders, one of the things that they got right was a, a let's call it a kind of um, 
sensitivity to the uh, intricacy of the recognition of, of distinctions. So what does that mean? It means that um, And it's funny in the in the in our in our culture in our context um, in our capitalist world, something like this would sort of not necessarily be a taboo. It would be kind of like an unsaid rule, right? A kind of implicit rule. But the example is is that um, the metal worker in the African sacred king uh, example that he's talking about. Um, would actually, uh, because they are dealing with um, a material which contains so much significance to the maintenance of the survival of the social order, um, the individuals that perform this duty, uh, in fact, are not to be um, engaged with, but only kind of revered in a certain way. And that when uh, they are working, when they are engaged with their labor, um, he says something along the lines of, you know, it's like the people would not even disturb them or, or question them. And that they actually lived on the outskirts of town by design. And then he goes further to say, like, uh, it was very common that if you were designated metal worker and uh, one of your friends knew just as much about metalworking as you do, um, it would be totally taboo for you to ever reveal any of your knowledge in front of them, right? So this is kind of like super um, interesting, uh, non-crisis oriented way of dealing, so dealing with social distinctions. Because what does that do if you have a very well lubed set of social distinctions? What does that do? It prevents the emergence of my mimetic violence, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about the um, uh, the status of academia today in terms of um, how we assign specialization, for example. I mean. It's gotten uh, the the notion of distinction is so problematized, so troubled, is so odious, is so illegitimate, right? That it's like we're beyond crisis. You know what I mean? We're in a kind of freeze, a freezer. Like there's a total paralysis, right? Um, I would say it's paralysis is terror. I mean that's an interesting thing for Gerard, which is the difference between mimetic violence and terror. You see the point? Because in mimetic violence. You still have a kind of metonymy. You still have a kind of um, relational violence. But when you when this um, schizogenesis, the kind of uh, uh, the structure is so rotten at its core, I'm almost thinking that a new theory of violence needs to be thought of. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Uh, I'm just sort of freestyling here, but that's my intuition. Um, I did not like Gerard's interview on 9-11, by the way. I posted it on Slack. I don't know if you read it. I thought it was pretty poor, personally, especially the way he talks about Islam. Anyways. Um, I was going to say, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, like, um, like the thing about the keeping the society sort of, like, well-flowing, that kind of, like, oiled machine type of thing yeah for him and so part of what he's saying if i'm getting it right is also that in order to do that the like you need that like the victim yeah you need the surrogate victim to keep yeah. that in yeah okay. yeah yeah what i was thinking also was like especially in the discussion of the sacker like similar to gambin is like but his thing seems to be to sort of reinstall a sovereign in some sense in the form of religion where Agamben is more like let's get rid of this sovereign. Gerard seems to be suggesting that actually we sort of need this 
to keep our communities functioning. Yes, ab absolutely. Although, I don't know, I mean, you read, if you read Agamben on the Franciscans, I think that, you know, not, it's not true that all religious orders for Agamben should be abolished or something like this, right? There are, there are emancipatory um, rules of life, rules that can govern collective life uh, that, that the Catholic Church has sanctioned. In history, right? And the Franciscans are kind of one example of that, right? Because in the Franciscan regula vida, uh, it was the case in which uh, the law permitted, um, like, I don't know if you're aware of the Franciscan community. I I have some intimate knowledge of them. Like, for example, if you ever go to a, just use a simple example, a birthday party within the Franciscan order. Um, you know, the notion of the Amish uh, cathars cathartic celebration of the Rumspringa and all of that. Well, the Franciscans actually um, uh, party and consume uh, alcohol at levels I've never seen in my life, in part because uh, like they're great, the, the celebrations are so rich, right? But it's part of the uniqueness of the way in which the law allows for a certain commonality at the level of um, all the objects and material of their world. So there's a kind of uh, very strange uh, freedom within the Franciscan order, which I haven't mastered it, but it's very elusive to me. So I think that Agamben is long story short, very still very much sympathetic to religion, uh, but maybe not as much as Gerard. So uh, this is an interesting quote that I've highlighted here um, because let's keep in mind something very significant. If generative violence or, or the monstrous double, right? They're kind of two sides of the same coin. Like um, the primal father, how can he be a hero? Because later he's a hero because of his death. That makes him a hero. But he's also a monstrous double. What is he a monstrous double of? He's a monstrous double of generative violence. And generative violence is fundamentally has unanimity. You see that? Unanimity. So the unanimity of the generative violence means that you can have a, a surrogate victim that is random because the generative violence itself is random. Because you see why? Like, uh, yeah, it's a, 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 a collapse of distinction produces this generative unanimous thing, right? So I think that's that's the reason why. Uh, and it's not even that, yeah, it's it's not even like random is almost like a, a difficult word because if, if all distinction is lost in some sense, it's not even, there's not even enough distinction to say random in a certain, do you right. know what I mean? Like it's it's just there, it's just whatever. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then um, I, I want to say it like this, like Gerard's theory of God is that God is that transcendent account that the community gives to the resolution of the emergence of generative violence. So you know what I'm saying? Like you have generative violence, in some mythic past, it reemerges in the same way that if you get in a profound fight with someone, or if you've ever been in a fight when you were in high school or at a bar when you're drunk or something like that. Um, like I'm reading Kim Stanley Robinson's book right now called Ministry for the Future. And I'll just give you a quick narration of this because it talks about generative violence a lot. Uh, it's a beautiful book. It basically opens with a, a Holocaust 
uh, in India, which is a heat wave that kills millions of people. And that forms a new experience for humanity. And then as you might imagine, um, a number of very serious uh, political efforts get off the ground to start assassinating the capitalist ruling class, naturally, right? And uh, Robinson narrates um, the experience of these mobs of, of pure violence and talks about the way in which um, uh, it's incredible because he's such a good writer, you know? Like he kind of narrates the monstrous double basically really well. Um, and then, by the way, this book is so good. Uh, you gotta read it. Anyways, so yeah, okay, there we are. Um, so yeah, then he goes on to the notion is, is, is it's, um, Every time the sacrifice accompanies its desired effect and bad violence is converted into good stability, the God is said to have accepted the offering of violence and consumed it. It is not surprising then. So God is about the, God is the restorer. But you know, by the way, this is an Old Testament God, right? Because uh, it's not exactly true that the New Testament God has this imminent covenant with humanity. I feel like um, there's a lot of theological breaks in Christian thought, uh, especially Protestantism. Anyways, that Gerard doesn't really think. Gerard is uh, a very much an Old Testament theologian, if you like. Um, I don't know if that's a weakness. I don't know, Kayim, do you agree with that, by the way? You're muted. I can't hear you if you're talking. Maybe while um, oh yeah, he, he must be he must have stepped away perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted I wanted to just quickly point out as well something that um, you kind of going off what Daniel uh, Oni had said as well uh, was that um, it's just an it's an interesting thing to to think of the necessity of the surrogate victim in Gerard's thought because in some sense even though he's saying that, that this must happen. My understanding is as the surrogate victim is taken up by Girardians, or at least those who embrace Girard's thought, is precisely to say, well, you're just making me a surrogate victim or a scapegoat now, right? Like this is like, and I mean, again, to like think Girard was Girard is to say, yes, like this is like, so to kind of dismiss being labeled a surrogate victim or a scapegoat is precisely, I think, to miss the point of Girard in, in some sense. Mm. So, uh, if we're taking Girard seriously, it's to say, yes, like we must have some kind of surrogate victim then. Um, right. So yeah, I, I don't know. I just think that because, because again, when you hear this kind of critique or like a, this Girard wielded in an in a anti-Marxist way or something, like, oh, well, the bourgeoisie or the rich or whatever are just a scapegoat. It's, to think Girard with Girard could be to say yes correct like and still it's effective regardless but yeah i just kind of wanted to point that out ah uh, yeah 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 well the scapegoat mechanism um doesn't go far enough the scapegoat mechanism seems to me to be sort of a, a half measure a half solution a kind of um um because if the issue is addressing uh, which I think it is the issue, uh, 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 adequately taking on. You no, know, what what might be an ethics that could adequately take on uh, and contest um, the latent generative violence that pops up, right? So, um, I think that that's interesting because yeah, because he's critiqued things like Marxism. We're giving a kind of partial answer, right? A partial analysis. Um, but then the, the natural question would be, okay, well then what's a, what's a more adequate answer? And I think his response would be, well, the formation of a kind of, um, uh, a kind of uh, 
cultural order in which rights could abstract uh, these logics. Um, and, you know, honestly, with Girard, honestly, you know what it really calls for is a whole interrogation of the status of belief, I feel like. Because, because he's not interested in the proposal of a kind of tearing down of the social order or revolution, right? Uh, uh, yet he is a kind of Gnostic, then you know what I'm saying? Like how then might modern man um, adequately confront the question of their belief qua sacrifice would be my, would be one question, I think. Uh, this theme of proximity I wanted to highlight for you. Um, this uh, is really interesting to me in the sense that, uh, like, I don't know if you've um, seen Lost. Does anybody watch the TV show Lost from a while ago? Um, remember that second and third season where they were fighting the others? Mm -hmm. I really felt like this was a, a primitive uh, example of a very Girardian scenario. I'm almost interested in re-watching it with a Girardian lens in some ways. Uh, it's such a good show. I know, it's so good. Um, here's the really important thing for our clarification. I want us to read this passage. I think this is very helpful. He says, all sacrificial rites are based on two substitutions. The first is provided by generative violence, which substitutes a single victim for all the members of the community. The second, and this one is ritualistic, is that of a victim for the surrogate victim. Okay. As we know, it is essential that the victim be drawn from outside the community. The surrogate victim, by contrast, is a member of the community. Ritual sacrifice is defined as an inexact imitation of the generative act. Why, we may ask, does sacrifice systematically exclude those who seem the most appropriate victims? Um, so the reason is, is because um, uh, of proximity to the sacred for the internal coherence of the community. You see in the second passage here, he kind of answers it. And here it, is, here it is even more clearly. The surrogate is outside the community because he belongs to the sacred. So I like this notion of the otherness of the sacred, right? I like this idea too. I wonder, I wonder I'm thinking here of Israel, Palestine in some sense. It was coming through my mind a lot in reading this chapter um, or, or even, um, you know, interminable uh, geographical conflicts which have a proximal nature. I mean, one of the interesting issues of uh, racism in America is that it was so uh, not exactly geographically segregated. It was an intimate relationality, which was, you know, permeating the home, right? Permeating the, I mean, one of the biggest, um, uh, critiques or threats that the South gave uh, to the possibility of losing the slave uh, system was a critique of the coherence of the family for both black and whites. You see why? Because if these intricate relations of care are disturbed, the argument of some, and these are like the so-called enlightened, educated Southern supporters of slavery, right? Um, would, would actually create an issue of, of mimetic violence, right? Um, to, through the deterioration of the family. And so like, it's interesting to me to think about conflicts where you have prox proximity, which is very differential. You see what I mean? Like, like in Israel, Palestine, it's true. I think that part of the chasm of the understanding of the other is itself an issue of contact. There's very little contact between the two communities, right? 
So it's just interesting to think about that versus what I'm calling more intimate violence, right? Um, okay. Um, whatever deception is involved in the sacrificial act must be attributed to the scapegoat mechanism, not to its beneficiaries. So what does that mean? Um, I see. Do you understand what that means? Does this sort of play up the proximity theme again in some manner? Well, I think what it means is that um, the, uh, the, the, the scapegoat mechanism uh, resolves, well, the, let me pose it as a question. What does the scapegoat mechanism resolve first and foremost? Repetitive violence. Is that the answer? I mean, that's what I think Gerard wants us to think. Well, I think that, um, I actually think something, I think that's actually, um, th there's two logics I would answer this from. It seems to me that the scapegoat can function well or can function not well. In Gerard's example, it functioning not well would be like Marxism, which is um, you've created a fake uh, scapegoat because you, you've been unable to identify a more primary surrogate victim. And that there is, this is also why his critique of Deleuze and Guattari says, society is not enough. It's not enough to blame our ills on society, just as, in his sense, it's not enough to blame our ills on, I don't know, class struggle, right? Obviously, we don't agree with this claim, but uh, that's a negative side of, it's like scapegoat mechanism that doesn't have efficacy. But I think there's scapegoating that does have efficacy when you have identified the surrogate outside victim. Because here he's saying, uh, whatever deception is involved in the sacrificial act must be attributed to the scapegoat mechanism, not to its beneficiaries. So um, the sacrifice victims, yeah, 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 okay. I think that's what he's saying, but you know what? Let me go back to the text and see where we're at with this. On 286, give me one minute. And we're gonna wrap up fairly soon, by the way. Um, Okay, two eighty six. Yeah. Okay. As long as we insist on interpreting the scapegoat in purely psychological terms, we can only assume. Um, uh, uh, the, the cannibals are seeking, he's, he's talking now about the Trupanamba uh, tribe, that the cannibals are seeking some sort of moral justification for their acts of violence. It is true that the more misdeeds the prisoner commits, the more legitimate the sanctions imposed, uh, but the primary purpose of the rights has nothing to do with satisfying neurosis. They're meant to bring about solid concrete results here we go. If the modern mind fails to recognize the strongly functional nature of the scapegoat operation and its sacrificial surrogates, okay, the most basic phenomenon of human culture will remain misunderstood and unresolved. So you have material and concrete examples of certain roles. And I think actually, if I might diagram those for next time, I will, I will promise to do that because I think we have to, because if you order us, if you, if you analyze a social order, it, a scapegoat is not the same as a surrogate victim. A surrogate victim is not the same as a monstrous double, right? You see my point? We can't just sort of conflate all these things, right? They have unique logics because they relate to each other in, in, in functional ways or structural ways, right? 
um, does that make sense, right? So because the surrogate victim promotes uh, uh, a quelling of violence, right? The, uh, like the, the functional nature of the scapegoat, um, let me tell you exactly what that is. Here he says, Uh, hold on. See, in that passage, I was unclear here as well because it seemed to me that he was using scapegoat and surrogate victim interchangeably. Monstrous double, I agree with you. I think that's something different, but it's, I was unclear if he was using surrogate victim and scapegoat interchangeably or not. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that they have different functions, to be honest with you. Um, hold on. Okay. Um, you know what, let me actually, this is a, a, a takeaway. I'm going to get to the bottom of this because I do think we need to graph the relations between these terms right because they are they are functions in some in some highly structural way right so um i'm not i'm not positive that scapegoat you know uh, is the same let's see if we um Okay, because, you know, here's the other issue, is that part of what happens in the case of the Tupanambas, if you read it here, what happens is that, is that the prisoner uh, is sought out as a stand-in substitute for what Gerard calls um, the original victim, the original victim. Right. And uh, yet that original victim actually comes from within the community. OK. But then the surrogate comes from outside. So you, may, you might have a tripartite thing of original victim, surrogate and then scapegoat. It, it, it may it may be like that. Um, so, let, let, but let us continue just to to, to round this out. Um, I felt that this theme of displacement, just like proximity, you know, is is very central. Um, and I think that uh, um, yes, from the primordial status of the victim comes the question of who's going to be the model of that primordial like it's kind of like an empty vessel right and in which case um that is the status of the hero by the way right so the one who steps into that becomes the hero this is why obviously uh, uh batman um uh, upon taking on the villain is performing the highest heroism right Okay, um, and then he gets into all this cannibalism of the Tupanambas, and um, um, uh, yes, the surrogate victim meets his death in the guise of the monstrous double. So what is the monstrous double? We can kind of close on this question. Um, so, uh, I think the monstrous double is really interesting because in some sense, um, uh, we, we have so many abundant examples of the emergence of a monstrous double. And it's very clear why the monstrous double is interesting because the monstrous double is not clearly of the sacred. He is a possessed 
subject within the social order who has somehow uh, taken on the sacred in on the interior. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like um, the uncanny come home, which really reminds me of this notion of calling, um, you know, the American lumpen proletariat monstrous doubles in some sense, kind of reminds me of that uh, problematic in a certain way. If you think about it from the standpoint of like, they are barbarians, like, you know, this whole notion of like American as an, America as an empire, and then, you know, all of the empires in the past have been overran by barbarians, but now the barbarians are no longer from outside the gates. They're actually the more um, pressing barbarians are from within. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know if that resonates with you, but kind of resonates with me. Um, and I love this business here. Oedipus is simultaneously son husband, father, and brother of the same human beings. Both have incorporated in themselves differences normally considered irreconcilable. Um, and then yes, he has, we can talk about this next time, but uh, he really gets into his coherent definition of religion and why uh, religion is powerful as it pertains to the dealing and treatment of difference. Um, but we can get into that next time. <clears throat> okay, my friends. Um, anything else for the good of the whole? Um, before we close? I might just throw out there for me, um, Roberto Esposito's book, Bios, I think it's called. Yes. Um, really, for me, um, maps okay. out. Es es Esposito. Esposito? I thought it was Esposito for years, so now it's <laughs> kind of corrected. I, uh, there you go, Esposito. That sounds better. Um, but his book, I think, is really helpful to sort of recognize some of these um, inter interplays that we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Um, and his the sort of idea there is that you know, sort of by constructing society, we we do form limits, uh, boundaries, and so like within the society is sort of what we're wanting to protect. And he borrows from Agamben to say, well, life is the thing that we're protecting. So, so by defending life and sort of uh, having a scapegoat outside of the community allows us to sort of um, paradoxically live by killing others. And that sort of really yeah. sounds a lot like what Gerard is pointing to, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very dangerous idea that's a uh, incredibly foolish and um, um, false idea, frankly, because the natural conclusion would be some kind of vulgar University of Chicago, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, uh, neoconservative logic, right? Which is, okay, well, the American proletariat is discontented, let's send them to war, which has been done. I mean, this is what these idiots right. do, right? right. That, that's how they think. This is Leo right. Strauss. This is their uh, whole project. Right. And I think this is an extremely, um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's very problematic. Well, uh, it sounds like Gerard would agree with that. And he would say it's, it's necessary, <laughs> which is hard to swallow. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. Probably right. Um, but what gives him the right? I mean, this is... Um, this is obscene to me. And, you know, the good news is, is that I think that financial capital is, uh, doesn't have the wherewithal to send us off to war, thank God. I mean, if it did, I think we would know it by now, you know? Mm. Um, it's just, it's, uh, it, 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 it doesn't have the, um, uh, the reserves to, to, to sustain it, you know? Right. Uh, so, um, yeah, but then, but then that means that the war emerges, and this is interesting dichotomy of inside outside. It emerges, it emerges from within. We should look at Greg yeah. Grandin. Greg Grandin uh, wrote an incredible book about um, the end of the American frontier uh, uh, last year, and a lot of these motifs of the um, the the collapse in an imaginary sense of the American um, proximal idea of its own 
uh, place and space uh, within the global order. Super interesting. I mean, the fact that um, the American empire is in decline is now um, of, of common sense for everyone, you know, and that, that, that's a very interesting reality to live with, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you can see also where it, it, it allows some of the differences to really thrive. So it's not so much now cast out to the other because the war maybe isn't the option. Yeah. It's now my neighbor has a different political view. So now we're at yeah. war. Yeah, I think, I think the next iteration of American fascism will no longer be about the globalists, but will actually be about um, a theory of, of, uh, of a different al alterity, right? Because, um, you know, the ta Coates line that like uh, the white proletariat was seeking resentment against tr uh, Obama as one man, mm -hmm. I think with everything being set in motion now, that kind of claim is untenable five years from now, when shit, when the social safety net collapses, as it will, right? Even more deteriorates. So we're gonna see a different theory of class war um, that, that will be very, um, uh, very, very, very um, high stakes. You know, very, very important that we work on that. I mean, that's a serious, serious issue to me. It's uh, I already, I already see it brewing. I mean, it's not looking good and it's, uh, uh, I don't know, but you know, then again, one thing that does give me hope is that dialectically, I think that the left will emerge first as a kind of affirmative outburst of some alternative, like we have before, like, you know what I mean? Like, Occupy came before Bernie kind of logic, you know? Like I think that optimistically, I think that something will come about where a new theory of emancipatory egalitarian life will have to emerge as an alternative and give people a choice, give people a choice. And then from that, you know, things could emerge from that. But I think that there's gonna be a great contestation and the left will hopefully be, I mean, it may come first from the reactionary right. It doesn't really matter, but I don't know. What do you guys think? That, that's, very, that's, that's bothered me um, a long time as if um, it's always been possible to find what you're describing in, in secret corners of, of, of scholarship or religion or where, where have you. Uh, but for something to be make made palatable for everyone um, is getting more and more difficult, and it's taking more and more work, even for for anyone you know within a, a professionalized knowledge system to get some relief, some liberation. Yeah, I mean, I think the the whole uh, project is really around the Socratic refinement of, of, um, of not knowing and kind of expanding the scope of being uh, capable of, of speaking in public through the prism of speculative thought, which is a, a, a very risky um, way of being in the world um, in our times. And I feel like um, it's something that's universally accessible to people. Um, irrespective of college degrees and all of that, right? What is risky? I think thinking is risky. Uh -huh. Thinker is risky. Um, because, yeah, I mean, people are forced into conditions of brute survival on the one hand, but when they're not in conditions of brute survival, they're also in a kind of highly instrumentalized form of knowledge acquisition, which actually has a relation to expertise, which is very reactionary, right? So there's a certain hierarchy that's intuitive and a priori in people's minds about the very status of intellectuals and intellectual freedom and so on. And the mere notion that you could have something like a Gramscian organic intellectual is almost off the table for people, or rather, they sort of- It really is. They seem to lack 
desire for it, you know, in, in a certain way. Or, or, or because it doesn't um, prove to have any connection to the value for it. There's nothing that can be made from it. It's not a problem. I was. You need to think of a different way in which intellectual life can be satisfying and can be profitable. For you. you know, and I think speculative thinking is one answer because speculative thinking is so universal. I mean, we're not here for anything other than a total combination of for our life, but for our thought, like it's both and, you know, for us, it's not, it's not just um, instrumentalized for us. Yeah. So is there any other way, I was, I was daydreaming the whole time this hour of how else, could, is there another way to do pedagogy um, other than like, you know, how we think of it? Um, so, right, because it's, it's really the tone. The tone uh, can, of speculative thinking can be dangerous, can, but it doesn't have to be. It can be wedded with another kind of um, life, uh, or, or, or maybe it does. I mean, is there any other way to, to, to live with the mind? Um, uh, do, does it have to be, you know, like mind in the morning and living in the evening? I don't know. I mean, I think the life of the mind starts in antagonism, in a good kind of antagonism, in, in, a, in a courage to live with antagonism and to invite it into your home. And so it's almost like the Girardian model of the sacred and proximity to the sacred is bound up within thought, um, I want to say. And I think that, um, you know, uh, I don't think that there's anything comparable to the desire that you can instill in someone for the liberation that comes through critical thinking. Um, I've never seen it um, because it affects everything. It affects the mind, the body, the whole life. It's, it's totally holistic, right? So um, maybe the closest second would be like a good diet or something. Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't know, like honestly, I think, um, People that go to college, whether they graduate or not, but if they are touched by a love for, for this kind of work, then well, hopefully it would, um, it would be one idea. Um, but then just, the, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think this is something for us to think about further, you know, the pedagogy of uh, emancipation. Uh, and, you know, uh, Freire is really good on this issue, right? I wanted to ask, Ben, you, you mentioned Esposito. Um, I, I think I asked once before, um, does anyone, does, does any, can anyone um, suggest anything on impossible community? Uh, um, or even, yeah. I'm, I'm like a secondary for, reading? Yeah, or, 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 or something similar to those, those books by Jean-Luc Nancy and, and Blancho on community. The only one that I read was Bios. I think that one's really good. It's pretty accessible. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think he does a good job too of kind of pulling from Agamben some stuff. Um, I'm not aware of any kind of secondary stuff. I was actually interested in at one point in finding more. Um, well, I, would, I mean, I meant because he wrote Communitas. Yeah. Um, which was really, really um, brilliant, beautiful. Yeah, I haven't read and then, that. Yeah, and then, um, and, and then now, just he, I think now, he wrote a book called Immunitas. Yeah. Um, um, fascinating how, no, no, it wasn't now. It was a couple of years, maybe five, yeah. ten years ago. And how relevant it is to us now with the plague. Sure. Yeah. I think there can be, so to answer your question about the pedagogy, I think there can be some uh, solutions there in psychology. And if we look at like Eastern philosophies and kind of the idea of no mind or no self, um, I think those are ways to kind of temper our passions, which we have lots of, and we have lots of knowledge, but we don't have good ways to sort of, um, um, like, like what we're, we're talking about, sort of access it actively versus reactively it all kind of goes into the same place. So if we can learn to kind of um, 
calm down a bit and separate things out a bit. Um, it could be done through critical thinking. It could also be done through things like meditation yeah. and sort of um, awareness of one's emotions. I think those are things that for me, I found sort of revolutionary, um, especially when I deal with people like the public. Um, a lot of times they really come in with this heavy burden of, I've got all this knowledge, but I don't know what to do with it. And it's like, okay, let's slow down. Let's figure out what comes first. Let's figure out what you can do and what you can't. And then they're good to go. Like, it's like uh, um, uh, just sort of, you know, cleaning out all these systems that we have of thought and emotion and things. It, it, they need to have oil changes every once in a while. We need to sort of uh, know what we're dealing with here sort of biologically. I'm not sure we do. Yeah. It makes me, I'm thinking back to Daniel's question or a contemplation of kind of politics and where we're out at and the rise of fascism uh, or a new kind of fascism in relation to Girard. And something that I've been trying, I've really been struggling with is thinking about well, what is it that I'm taking from this book, reading it closely and trying to figure out if I disagree with Gerard so much, what, why am I still reading it? And, and <laughs> why is it in the back of my mind in some sense? And what, and I think what I, I really, I think a good point that Gerard makes, um, something that stuck with me is that, and Daniel, you kind of started to talk about this was maybe a critique of Marxist or, or something like this could almost be said is that, well, you to have this idea of permanent revolution or something like this you're almost like the the rules of the game are being made too explicit in some sense what a surrogate victim does is that it in some sense conceals what's going on right. and something that i've really been thinking about with gerard in relation to this is that uh you know other communist or leftist revolutions of the past in Russia, you had the czar as kind of this figure of surrogate victim. Um, you have, you know, you, you have like these particular people. And it seems to me that in the US right now, we have a very hard time on the left of naming a particular enemy that is not capitalism, the state or whatever. And I wonder if thinking through Gerard more, we might figure out how to better articulate an enemy, a particular enemy, even if we understand that it's not the whole enemy or the system in and of itself. Because this is what liberalism, I think, does very well still, right? To name Trump and say, it's Trump and Trump is bad and da da da. And it's effective in that way, in, in a certain sense. So maybe thinking through how to articulate uh, an enemy or someone to fight against, even if they are a stand in for a larger process, might be helpful for the left in some sense. Yeah, I love that. I really like that. I really agree with that. I mean, I also think actually, I agree with everything you said with the exception of the czar piece, because actually, you know, uh, my understanding of the monstrous double, I know you, you refer to him as surrogate victim and maybe he is a surrogate victim. I actually think the surrogate victim would actually be something like the peasantry in the case of Bolshevik revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, uh, uh, so the, the idea of how one goes about, and you see this in Black Lives Matter as well, how one goes about um, locating um, first the uh, originary victim, and then from that deriving a notion of surrogacy from it, but then also thinking about the notion of monstrous double, because monstrous double seems to me almost like, um, don't know like even a theory of uh, the 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 leader who could embody um through there or even like a collective who could even think of like the notion of a, pro a prophet of of somebody who could embody um and voice the unsaid um degradations and sufferings and so on um so I just wonder, I think it's really, it would be really useful for us to diagram out Gerard's models a little bit more so we're able to better apply it all more clearly because it's so functionalist and it's so structural. It should therefore 
if we're good Girardians, we should be able to take any situation and place place it onto it, you know? So I will I will do my best to try to do that this weekend and try to, for my own. You. That'd, be, that'd be very helpful for me too, because yeah. it's something I'm still struggling to. And then we can that. play with it. We can kind of mod- edit it together and stuff like that, you know? I was going to say too, if you're going to do that, you might want to check Carpman's Triangle, K-A-R-P-M-A-N. Maybe I can post about it on Slack. Yeah, please. It's kind of the same idea interpersonally that you sort of have a triangulation sort of naturally and then you have a victim you have a perpetrator and then you have a rescuer somebody who feels compelled to enter the the battle and they usually side with the victim but then everything sort of gets reshuffled and repeated so i think that too could be sort of a girardian sort of notion which is you you don't have stability and so it leads to something (laughs) it leads to a problem because desire is mixed up in it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. So let us, for next time, look at finishing the book by reading chapter 11. If you haven't read 10, go ahead and do that. And then let us also uh, look at the section from this one, Things Hidden. I'll put the PDF up there. Of uh, this, you know, more philosophical one of... um, of uh, what's called book three, chapter uh, one and two. One is on my medic desire and the other one is desire without object. Um, That would be very helpful for us. Uh, Yes, very helpful. And honestly, the other way to really understand my medic desire is to go back to uh, the desire to see it in the novel, the early Gerard, to look at his theory on Proust. which is so interesting. It just, it's a, a, from what I've read, it's a very nice intervention. Um, so yes, and yes, and finish that anti-Oedipus review because I tell you, it is so good. I have to write something about Gerard after this whole encounter. This is like an absolute necessity for me. And Kaya, yeah, I really want to. Um, on the question- What are you gonna write? Uh, what are you thinking of writing? What am I going to write? Yeah. Well, I have two general ideas. One is to look further at this notion of schismogenesis and Berardi, Franco Bifo Berardi, who actually gives us a neurological extension of schismogenesis that is very compelling to me. And I kind of want to... Um, follow some Deleuze and Guattari studies that have gone further. So I want to look at that. And I also want to look at like Gerard and Marxism tentatively. But yes, sometime down the line, Guy, I'm, I'm happy to do a, a course on philosophy of community. I mean, I did my dissertation on that topic, so I have much. Yeah? To- cool. Yeah. So, cool. <clears throat> down. <laughs>